welcome to a special edition of the Pedestrian Podcast. Joining myself, Stuart Court, and as ever, Mr. Adam Nathan. That's where you say hello, Adam. Hi, Stuart. <laughs> how, how you doing? I thought we were going straight into the chat, but that's okay. Uh, it's quite possibly the busiest person in sports media. She's the host of the ESPN Daily Podcast and the Mina Khan Show featuring Lenny and is a senior writer for ESPN.com amongst a whole cavalcade of other things. It's wild to say this next bit, but Mina Kimes, welcome to the Pedestrian Podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. I think Adam? we can probably thank you as opposed to, I, I don't <laughs> think you need to thank us too much for... Uh... Let's see how it goes and then we'll decide at the end who, <laughs> okay. who owes who a thank you. All right, that makes sense. That makes sense. So obviously the world has been turned completely upside down and you guys are still plodding along. How are you guys finding it over there? Presumably fairly similar to the nonsense we have to do over here. Yeah, well, I'm in Los Angeles, which um, hasn't been hit as hard by this as some cities, uh, including Seattle, right? Mm-hmm. And obviously New York, where I used to live, uh, is really battling right now. So I, I feel pretty fortunate. Um, and I have been able to do a lot of the stuff I do at ESPN from home, the daily podcast, a football mm-hmm. show. And, and the craziest thing, I think, not craziest, but actually the most normal thing is that football has continued here uh, without stop uh at free agency the draft which is a blessing for people like me because it's given us a lot to talk about what did you make of that i mean there's obviously a lot of the sporting world is completely shut down our premier yeah. league is all shut down and in a way it's been really nice to have something to think about and talk about that's not just the four walls that we all sit in but then there's an argument that it's been insensitive, which I don't necessarily subscribe to, but I guess everyone's got a different viewpoint on it. H- how have you found it? Presumably it's kept you, you know, interest, interested in what's going on with work. I I have also found it to be a welcome respite from the news, and I think a lot of people feel that way. I understand, you know, that argument that it feels kind of tone deaf at times when we talk about this, and it, it is weird to log on to social media and – it's coronavirus, 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 horrible, 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 horrible free agent signing. It is a little <laughs> bit jarring, but I, I actually I do think it's quite welcome for a lot of people and not just people in the industry like me, who, you know, obviously benefit from having something to talk about. But I think football fans are, are and this is based on what we see in their interest and their desire to just have some semblance of normalcy amidst all of this. Yeah, I think that happened earlier this morning when the Lions signed Jerome Allison and Adam Schefter tweeted. I was like, oh, yeah, that's. That's also going on currently as well. Yeah. yeah. Normal March things. Uh, so one of those things that seems the most fun thing to do uh, with when, with you're involved in is highly questionable, especially in the Tampa Buccaneers, Tom Brady world we now live in, Mina. Yeah, that, that gave us, I think I joked on Twitter that Tom Brady gave sports media a stimulus because it gave, I think we talked about it for like four, and that's not over. We're going to keep talking about that, <laughs> especially since, you know, there's still with uh, James Winston and Cam still out there, uh, not t- tied to any team right now. I don't know when this podcast is coming out, but that could change. But it, there's still some pretty big fish out there in free agency. So how... Just to scale it right back, uh, how did you kind of get started in everything that you're doing? I mean, I, your brother, Isaac, is a mutual friend, well, he's a friend of mine through our mutual love of two sports teams, Spurs and the Seahawks. And he reliably informs me that you missed out on two World Cup quarterfinals in South Korea uh, for what he called genius camp. Um, and and or that he did preface it by saying that that took you to Yale and him to Arizona State. So I guess uh, you probably came out on top of that in the end. But how how did you kind of get into what you're doing from uh, where, where did it all start for you in the, in the industry? Sure. I was a business journalist for a long time out of college. I wrote about finance and then did investigative stories for Fortune magazine and Bloomberg News. And then um, football was just a hobby for me. ESPN hired me in 2014 so my god it's been six years now it's crazy um and i was a writer at first uh, just writing features about football players really all sorts of athletes not just nfl and then started doing podcasting radio and then eventually television and is i mean it's funny you talk about the, the writing because i was thinking when i was driving around today about the piece that you did on deandre hopkins i think which is something that i think a lot got a lot of pop over here is there something that you particularly enjoy more than the TV work or is it just you're just talented at everything with all due respect that you could just love doing all of it? That's very kind of you. I, I just enjoy uh, 
talking about football the most. <laughs> I, I mean, I enjoy all the things I do a lot, but you know, I got into ESPN because I loved football. Uh, and I think I'm kind of lucky in that I was actually late to working in it because I haven't had that beaten out of me yet. Like I still am a fan at heart. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little bit harder, right? I was thinking about, so last week, I guess it was Thursday. Yeah. Jesus. I've lost all drag. I don't There's know. no days anymore. There's no, I know. Fair. What is the weekend? <laughs> what is the morning? What is night? Um, just social constructs. Um, yeah. So I, I think it was Thursday. I watched the end of Super Bowl 49 with the guys at PFF for charity, which I had not watched in its entirety. Uh, the fourth quarter of the Seahawks Patriots Super Bowl since it happened. And I remember vividly that week it was, I had started working at ESPN, but I wasn't really an analyst back then. I was just a writer. So I didn't have to go on TV the next day and talk about it. And I, it was so lucky because I was thinking now if that happened, I'd have to go on all of our shows the next day (laughs) and talk about it. It would have been awful, but um, I I still find that I care a lot. But that's the best thing. I mean, I listened to you on like the Damashek podcast a couple of times. And I think one thing that he always says is that, you know, he does what he does because he's a fan. And I think certainly from our perspective, I enjoy everything that you guys do a lot more over there. I mean, over here, people have quite a, an idea that they should stay neutral. But actually showing some partisanship for me makes things much more enjoyable and presumably frees you up a lot more to kind of be a lot more real than you otherwise would be if you had to pretend that you were just a robotic sports fan. I, I think so. I, I, you know, and I, the main thing is trying to be fair while being transparent about homerism, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think homerism is when you complain about like calls, <laughs> 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 and I try not to do that uh, outside of my Twitter. I, I try not to do that on my podcast or the shows I'm on. I'm not going to complain about, you know, I guess Seattle getting a bad call their way or whatever, what I perceive to be a bad call. Um, and I find that I'm pretty critical of the team, but you know, I, I just had my friend Bill Barnwell on my football podcast and we graded all the teams and I thought he thought Seattle's free agency was a lot worse than mine. So maybe I am still a homer. <laughs> so is you, you, you said you watched the Super Bowl 49, uh, with the PFF guys earlier in the week, you doing that, you raised quite a bit of cash for uh, West Seattle food bank is raising that much cash for, it's such a worthy cause, the only way people can get you to watch that fourth quarter. That's... <laughs> you know, it, it, I was a little bit more numb to it than I thought. At the show I'm on, one of the shows, Highly Questionable, they play the interception all the time to troll me. Um, <laughs> but it is worse when you have to watch the whole fourth quarter leading up to it and getting your hopes up. And also just seeing that game in particular, I don't know how well you guys remember it, but there's just so many weird sliding doors moments where things could have gone another way, right? Like... Uh, tiny things that I had forgotten, like uh, Kyle Arrington, the Pats defensive back, getting benched early in the second half because he was playing so god-awful, and Malcolm Butler coming in. If he doesn't get benched, Butler doesn't come in, Butler doesn't make... Just stuff like that, you know, (laughs) which is kind of the fun part about watching old games. Yeah, and Jeremy Lane exploded, didn't he? Yeah, at the very beginning of the game, yeah, right after pitching Brady, yeah. And that set off a chain reaction as well because it moved Byron Maxwell, who was an outside corner to the slot, which he shouldn't have been playing. <laughs> you know, he's a little slower. And uh, Therald Simon, who was not very good in that game, came in and, yeah, it just set off a, a bit of a reaction. I mean, you could have had a Chris Matthews Super Bowl MVP for, yeah. like, the only game he ever really contributed in. He was awesome in that game. <laughs> what happened, though, and again, at some point, they moved Brandon Browner over just trying to do a size-on-size matchup in that helped a lot for New England. Yeah. Uh, go on, I'm sorry. No, off the off the So uh, so you as you said you said you are a Seahawks fan, but like me and Adam, you're a Seahawks fan having never lived in the city. How 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 did you become to be a Seahawks fan? Um my dad is from Seattle. So yeah, I was I'm all Seattle sports. So my dad was in the military. So I, I grew up all over the country. But we mm-hmm. my brother and my whole family, we are all Seattle, Washington. I, I was a huge Mariners fan as a kid, still a Mariners fan, which uh, is not an easy. Actually, it's gotten, it's, it's lasted so long that it is kind of easy. Um, and yeah, so it's it's all through my dad. 
I was listening to a bit of Seattle radio a couple of days ago, and there's been a lot of pain in big moments compared to the like as a ratio of how many big moments have ended in quite painful scenarios for Seattle sports fans. It's not been that great. Yeah, you know, I I think after and this is why 49 didn't hurt as much as it could after your team wins the Super Bowl. It sort of lessens everything that's come after that, I think. Mm -hmm. So that helped a great deal. But yeah, with the Mariners and then losing the Sonics, it it truly, you know, I I, um, should get into the Sounders and the Storm who have had some success, but I just haven't. And Super Bowl 48 left it a mark literally on you because I believe you have it tattooed on your arm. Where, where did you uh, end up watching that? Were you, you weren't working for ESPN at the time, so where were you for that? I actually I was thinking about going because it was in New York, mm-hmm. and I lived in New York at the time, but I really wanted to watch with my friends who I had watched with forever in New York. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we watched – a bunch of us watched at the same bar – that we always watched at for years and um you know i was really glad it shook out that way because one of my friends who i watched with passed away not long after that and it's kind of one of my fondest memories is getting Mm -hmm. to watch with him i did a similar thing i ended up flying my the reason i'm a seattle fan is that uh my aunt had to move there uh as kind of a, a microsoft wife from the uk about 25 years ago and uh i decided in october of that year that we were going to win the super bowl and be in it so i wanted to be in seattle <laughs> for it so if you ever speak to richard sherman please thank him on my behalf because he <laughs> saved that entire two and a half week trip <laughs> we planned for. and uh, that tip happened at about 4 30 a.m over here so i had like the, the oh. silent screaming around the house and not being able to wake anyone up with kind of the biggest moment that you've ever seen that's great I'd, I'd, the next thing on the nfl calendar is the uh well currently is the draft last year you yeah. went went slightly viral with your reaction to uh the dk metcalf selection the back end of the second round were you relieved or happier with how dominant that that dk metcalf looks and will hopefully continue to look after that after that clip went a bit viral yeah, that's the rare clip of me that hasn't aged poorly. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take that one. Um, I, you know what? I like I like that signing because I like where we got him. You know, I like the value. I think if they had, in all honesty, even though his production was absolutely, um, you know, it corresponded to a first round pick, for, you know, undoubtedly, right? Um, if we had taken him in the first round, I don't think I would have been as thrilled because um, I was sort of I was a bit dubious of him. But then when he kept falling and falling, I started thinking, all right, yeah, yeah, let's just <laughs> worth a flyer here. Um, so I'm thrilled. I, you know, I was also really, I think with Metcalf, I was super impressed by just his development, right? Um, because he was not, you know, the criticisms of him were entirely valid as it pertained to the limited route tree, the lack of sort of agility, obviously the infamous three cone. And I think you saw him get better at all of those things as the season went on. So mm-hmm. I'm Super excited to see where he goes. I liked the Dorset signing, uh, just adding a little bit more speed downfield. I think wide receiver is a area at which Seattle's pretty set. So I was this, thinking, oh, go on, Stu. Yeah, just quickly, this does feel like a year for the Seahawks where they literally could do everything with their first pick and they'd be like, okay, yeah. fair enough, because there doesn't really seem to be um, a read on the team this, this year. Is that fair yeah i i I mean look anyone who thinks they can ever predict what seattle's doing with their first pick is (laughs) trading down that's what you should predict um (laughs) i will say a lot of it's probably contingent on whether or not they sign Clowney or one of the remaining pass rushers right because that's quite obviously the biggest area of need for this team i thought Mm -hmm. i'd seen a lot of people were mocking um cornerbacks to them like trevon diggs people thought would be a nice fit you know, for that, for Seattle's scheme. But after they went out and traded for Quentin Dunbar, that sort of lessened that need. Although personally, I would love for them to, you know, possibly draft at least one or two corners, maybe look Mm -hmm. for a nickel. Um, But I, I wouldn't be surprised if they go offensive line or defensive line. I was interested when you said about where you're talking to Bill that you had the Seahawks free agency thus far um, as maybe higher than he did. Now that may be 31 versus 32 for all I know, but um, you know, I've been looking at it and 
I saw that Emmanuel Sanders signed for the Saints, for example, and I just thought, huh, that's really cool. Like they're going for it, like balls of the wall, YOLO. And you know, you had Russell Wilson saying over the you know, a couple of months ago, we could do with a couple more stars, and I think everyone probably agrees with that. And they've been, you know, it's been like steady plodding progress for me so far in free agency. There hasn't been the the splash signing, and with a limited uh, probably preseason, fewer mini camps. Is there any thought to the idea that maybe this is the year that you just kind of stuff the draft picks and use them for players when you see like what AJ Bouye and Claire's Campbell go for from a, a draft stock on the pick? Do you think there could be a, a bit more aggression or are you kind of happy with, with the way in which they're going so far? Well, I think Bill's always, he's at, he's right to point out that, you know, generally, and this isn't really what's been happening with Seattle, but if your team's spending a lot in free agency, you've already lost, right? Mm-hmm. Um because typically if players are available in free agency, there's a reason and very the best players in the NFL never reach that. And the good teams are able to, you know, promote internally and find players in the draft um, with Seattle. I think he just didn't like some of the particular players they had brought back. We had a little bit of it like I, I Jaron Reed was, I think, a player we disagreed about because, mm-hmm. um, you know, he was not good last year when he came back. But. Being a Seattle fan, I felt that he was, you know, extremely good the years before. It's also a two-year, $23 million deal, so he'll be up again. So, um, it, which was the case a lot in the free agency this year, by the way, a lot of two- and three-year deals. But I um, I think that to go to your point about your question, I guess, about sort of approaching what's going to be a very weird offseason and debating whether to – aggressively try to fill your needs in a free agency versus the draft. It really just depends on your timeline. Like I, mm-hmm. I think a team like Seattle's done always done a really good job. I think of trying to do both, you know, mm-hmm. um, at the same time, which is something the good teams do. I think that that short term and that's simultaneous short and long term building. I think the saints are uniquely they don't really think about the future that much but they've been blessed with some really strong drafts much stronger than seattle's that have allowed them to kind of keep doing that recently um but i i feel like seattle's walked that line pretty well now if they don't sign a top tier pass rusher that would be pretty disappointing so it doesn't have to be clowny necessarily right Mm -hmm. but it does feel like they need to do something outside of just handling it in the draft yeah, there was a few of these free agency signs, especially BJ Finney, who is kind of like, well, I have no idea who that is or where he plays, Adam. Uh, yeah, I feel like if someone had said Adam Nathan has signed for the Seahawks <laughs> to play yeah. uh, offensive tackle four million a year, fans would be like, yeah, strengthen no, that line. Nobody knows any <laughs> of the offensive me. linemen, right? <laughs> no. Like Granite Shell or whatever, Finney. Finney was apparently <laughs> decent. I, I just ask, You just ask people who watch their old teams. He's, um, way, he's an actual ton, isn't he? An actual ton sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. Also, just, you know, with offensive linemen, I think most of the time we're not very good at evaluating them, especially if it's a player on a bad line. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. I mean, it, this, it, it'll seem weird to kind of try and contextualize sport with what's going on in the modern world, uh, you know, the virus world that we're living in at the moment. But I kind of feel like the idea of, looking you know three four years to the future it might be the kind of thing that human beings just don't do anymore given what you know all of a sudden you snap your fingers and the world turns on its head do you think there might be an element of people try to be a bit more win now in sport and not you know maybe not necessarily just the nfl but just like you know we don't know what's coming next month so if we can do it especially if you've got you you know you have the most important piece like a quarterback like russell wilson is there the idea like let's just go for it because who knows what next year is going to bring so sign and leap pass rusher because we're all going to get the virus. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's it. No, I, I think um, the issue with the NFL is um, the TV deals and the cap. And I think that is why Bill and I talk about this. A lot of these players, by the way, have signed uh, these two and three year deals because there's this sort of expectation that – there's going to be a new TV deal. The cap's going to go way up. Right now, there's a ton of uncertainty. Um, and I do think that is affecting how... T- now, I don't think it's making teams necessarily go all in this year, per se. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think it's affecting individual contracts. 
Stu. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I thought you were going to have a follow-up. Um, so one, one of the things, one of the places to see what's could go with this year, obviously, is possibly running back because obviously they currently have none with all four working limbs and uh, muscles. And if if the Seahawks go sort sort of early with a running back this year, does that kind of show that they've been following what's happening down the West Coast? In, in uh, well, another one of your employees at <laughs> yeah. the Rams with Gurley. Yeah, I think well the Seahawks have two. Obviously, they've got Penny and Carson, right? Uh, Carson is entering the last year of mm-hmm. his rookie contract. I don't yeah. know where those guys are with their health, but I imagine both would be on track for a return. Uh, definitely Carson. Yeah. Um, so that's going to factor into things. I I really like Chris Carson. I am obviously part of the, you know, don't pay running backs a ton of money, always mm-hmm. be drafting late round running backs camp but i think he is actually a pretty unique talent so i I wouldn't be disappointed if they try to find some way to keep him obviously without you know paying any sort of premium salary i think he actually is just such a great fit for the team as Mm -hmm. well um so we'll see i i my i don't seattle has obviously handled the position differently from how i would in the past but my preference would be for them to try to find a way to keep him and also you know again maybe drafting a later round option yeah and quite kind of out in front of that on the analytics side of running and the the value of that and passing and you've managed to do it in not a way that makes anyone that doesn't quite get it (laughs) feel like a complete idiot um now it it would seem like obviously it's a pass league you need to pass you need to pass you need to pass but presumably as teams have to alter their plan to do that that would feasibly open up other areas because you know it's i guess it's like a a blanket that you can't fill the whole field at all times so do you do the top or the bottom is there kind of a an idea in the analytics community that there's something coming after this pass heavy pass to win system or is it just going to be seen as this is the way to do it and that's how you should do it well it's it's been interesting to watch teams like San Francisco and Baltimore, I think, sort of evolve. Mm-hmm. To me, they're sort of representative of that next phase of a rushing offense, which in San Francisco's case is not talent based, although they have a unique amount of speed at the position, but schematic. Mm-hmm. And then in Baltimore's case, I think so much of it revolves around using their quarterback, who also obviously can run to create numbers advantages. Um, so it's, and they, they use a ton of motion as well and do a lot of creative things too in the running game. Um, but with them, I think it's a little bit more centered around Lamar Jackson and what they can use, how they can use him to manipulate defenses. Um, so I think it's easy to point to those teams and say that's the future, but most teams in the NFL do not have Kyle Shanahan and Lamar Jackson. So um, unless you do have those things, <laughs> I, I think uh, maybe, you know, and maybe we'll start seeing more elements of that Shanahanian offense around the league. But I think um, those are pretty unique examples. So the next coach of like, I don't know, let's say that the Lions will be like Kyle Shanahan's doorman or something like that. <laughs> exactly. He's the next McVay. Perfect. Still better. Perfect. <laughs> Still better than Patricia, to be quite yeah, honest. Yeah, not wrong, not wrong. Uh, earlier we mentioned uh, uh, DeAndre Hopkins and the f- unbelievable article you wrote on him and his uh, the relationship he had with his mother and uh, everything else. So that got a lot of attention on one of the Monday night games last season when uh, Tess and Booger told, t- basically retold the story you told a couple of years ago. But seeing him get traded, how he does, um, when you've spent time with him and his family, did, does that hit different for you now than it did before you started getting to know and getting to talk to these players? Yeah, it's like anything that if you spend enough time talking to someone and learn their story, you're probably going to find yourself rooting for them. I mean, it's you can find something or a point of connection with any athlete. And I don't love them all, you know, the guys I've written about. I mean, I did a story about Antonio Brown a few years ago, who's obviously an extremely problematic figure. Um, but the story was about how him and T.Y. Hilton mm-hmm. uh, grew up together and played football together as kids and then had vastly different lives. Uh, T.Y.'s 
had a really stable family situation. His dad was their coach, uh, who's a lovely guy. And, you know, he did it. T.Y. is a wonderful, sweet person. <laughs> and and he really, I think, had that sort of foundation. Whereas Antonio, and this is what the story was about, you know, his dad left the family. He was homeless for a while, bounced around um, schools, colleges. And that doesn't necessarily change the way I look at sort of his actions in the present tense, but it certainly informs, I think, my how I view his story and how he's been shaped. And I think that's always your goal with doing these kinds of profiles is learning more about athletes so that you can understand them a little bit better. Yeah. Also, also one, one more thing on Hopkins. Uh, do you think Seattle will ever get like even just one year of Brady's AFC East? <laughs> the Rams are possibly on the bit oh, of the downturn, and, it, and then DeAndre Hopkins rolls into town. The NFC West is going to be a nightmare. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if people are prepared for that. It's going to be crazy. Yeah, I, don't I, I kind of feel like, yeah, I mean, it's it's just mad. Any team could could win it. I mean, the, the long forms are, are fascinating, and as you say, you get to just do such a deep dive into people's lives and their family situation. If you could do like a dream long form on an NFL player, have you got one that's like, yeah, that's the one you really want? Oh gosh, well it's always been Marshawn Lynch. Yeah, okay, he's just the best. He's, he's unbelievable. I uh, I think he's one of the most fascinating athletes of like the 21st century. Mhm. So that I would think, be my, my ideal guy. We had Michael Robinson on the podcast a couple of years ago, and he did say that he would try and get Marshawn on, and <laughs> the, the phone hasn't yet yet rung. But he's I too busy gave being on the, Westworld. I know. I, th- I think I may have put a five instead of a four on the digit for my phone number. That's probably the only reason why he's probably had loads of missed calls or whatever. I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but that's 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 the Marshawn thing. He's in a show which is kind of niche, although it's a pretty big successful one in Westworld, and no one really bats an eyelid and go, "Yeah, okay, Marshawn's on doing that now," kind of thing. He's yeah. he's, he's 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 unbelievable. Adam, like the most interesting man in the world. Yeah. Well, we're, we're conscious that you've got time constraints and you know we've, we've covered a lot of the Seahawks stuff now the really important stuff obviously your family does hail from Korea uh, and there is a, a, the greatest Korean sportsman of all time in my opinion Sun Hyun Ming who plays for for Spurs who I know is Isaac's team and I think I think you have like a leaning towards Spurs more than maybe l- less so like a real fan but um, presumably I, I, I believe Mama Kimes is a big big, big Sun fan big as time, well yeah so I support Tottenham just because I want her to be happy. Mm-hmm. I don't follow, you know, EPL super closely, but uh, every now and then I do watch if there's like a big match or something. Although the time zone here is not kind. Right. I, mean, I have to say the only good thing about the pandemic so far is that there hasn't been Spurs to follow. <laughs> so I'd say if, if you if you want them a to blessing. win for your mum, yeah, if you want them to win for your mum to be happy, I would probably suggest that that's uh, not not the finest <laughs> team that she could. Have, hopefully, Sun can move on to greener pastures for the sake oh. of your mum's uh, your mum's well being. Um, I and I another like existential, very odd thing that I found about uh, this kind of time period is that there hasn't been any sport to follow, and it's almost like cold turkey. And sport does an amazing job of telling you that everything every day is like a life or death situation. If you win, it's ecstasy. If you lose, it's hell. Now, it's slightly different in the NFL because it's off season anyway. But I I found that kind of not having a sports team to follow has almost been a bit kind of liberating from an emotional standpoint. Do you think there's any chance of like the futility of sport, albeit we desperately miss the competition, like the futility of it? could kind of be illuminated by the fact that there's an absence of it. I think the opposite seems to be happening where Mm -hmm. people just crave that sort of, it's, it's like a very artificial, the stakes are artificial, right? Because we're Mm -hmm. constructing them. It's not life or death, as you mentioned. Um, But they're very real in that they bring us together. I mean, like, you know, I was telling you earlier about watching 48 with my friend. Um, you know, I it was kind of a shitty Super Bowl, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I remember caring so much. And, and you kind of ask yourself, why do you care? And you realize, oh, right, because of the people I watch it with and talk about it with. And it's not fun if it's just me. Like in a vacuum, 
in a you know quarantined world if we didn't have connection i don't think i would actually really enjoy watching sports that much couldn't agree more and i think everyone misses those points of connection and and when we have the draft we're going to get that you know when seattle inevitably does trades down we're all going to get online and bitch about it together <laughs> uh and Bengals fans are going to be stoked when they get burrow and all those it's not about the team it's about the community i think and and i think that's something that's going only going to be reaffirmed when it comes back. Yeah, that's that's exactly what me, me and you said Adam, about our trips over to Seattle. It's, after a couple of years, it wasn't about seeing the team, seeing the game. It's about seeing people who are now friends and like uh, being the, said, the, that the connection six, with the people. The 60 minutes was by far and away the most irrelevant part of the whole week and, and weekend. It was yeah. all about the community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, look, we really do massively appreciate your time um, and we don't want to keep any longer than than you need to be and you're probably bored out of your mind out of our <laughs> mundane questions but we have thoroughly enjoyed it now we do have a, a traditional question that we do ask a lot of our guests and that is what is the worst meat the worst meat okay this is interesting coming from your part of the world um mm, let me think about this because i eat all meats mm-hmm. i mean all, not exotic meats but uh so as an english jew i don't have to do thanksgiving or christmas turkey and i, I don't like turkey. The ultimate blessing I don't like turkey. I don't like um, turkey either. I don't like like Thanksgiving turkey. I've always felt we had steak at Thanksgiving this year. And I also don't like deli turkey. Like a turkey sandwich is the worst awful. sandwich. Awful. awful sandwich. I agree. Okay. Only made palatable by the use of copious condiments. Yeah, it's a, it's like a hot dog in the way. It's, it's just a vessel for sauce for sauces, I think. You get it. Okay, well, if you ever take a trip <laughs> to London, you are be We'll love to show you around the places where you can get the best non-turkey <laughs> meats. And uh, have, have you been to London before or the UK before? A couple of times, yeah, in my old life as a business journalist, yeah. Whereabouts were, were you based? Um, no, just for work, for trips, writing about, I think I went to write about a hedge fund once and then mm-hmm. uh, for some sort of conference. So. All London based. I get a lot of pop from Stu and other people on our, our UK group uh, because I am very London centric, as all London people are. Um, mm-hmm. Stu gets quite mad at me for it, but I presume you were just mainly in the in the capital. <laughs> I was, although I did go to Oxford. Briefly. Okay, that's allowed. That's that, you, you, <laughs> I can just about smell Oxford from here, so that's not too too bad. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much again for your time we really appreciate it and um i'd say don't be a stranger but i think you know we'll, we'll see what we can do you're probably a bit too busy to to fit us in but thank you again so much oh thanks for having me bye guys bye.